So this is module three, not module four, but it's the fourth lecture uh, today. So that's what we're going to do. So we've got about an hour, um, and we're going to talk about um, about databases. Um, so this is kind of a lead into um, what you were doing, where you're converting spectra to, to lists. But what do you do with those lists, or how do you actually identify these compounds or peaks, um, and what are they associated with? So we're going to talk about um, uh, the different types of databases that are available, the different types of database models. Uh, we're going to look at some of the publicly available NMR and MS databases. We're also going to talk about pathway databases, as well as comprehensive metabolomic databases. Um, these are the resources that you could use to help analyze the data that you may have just collected in the last hour or two um, to interpret them. There are also databases that are linked into MetaboAnalyst as well that are used to help in the interpretation. And so depending on whether you want to do it first or second or as an integrated process, it's, it's, it's sort of up to you and up to the particular um, problem you're working with. What we're doing in, in metabolomics is, is kind of a mix of both bioinformatics and something called cheminformatics. So bioinformatics is about biological data. Cheminformatics is about chemical data, like metabolites. But because metabolites are also connected to other parts of biology, the proteome, the genome, the transcriptome, it, it, it kind of um, connects uh, pretty well to bioinformatics as well. Historically, the two have been like silos, very different. Um, cheminformatics was actually, is a much older field that was developed in the 1960s. It was originally purposed for organic chemists, and it was structured to be a user pay limited public access model. Um, chemical abstract services and the American Chemical Society make tens of millions of dollars a year selling chem informatics data. Many other large companies also make tens of millions of dollars selling chemical data. Now, in the world of bioinformatics, it's a newer field. Uh, it was designed for the needs of biologists, molecular biologists, and geneticists. Instead of being a, a user pay model, it was an open access and now become largely a web-based model. And most of the software and tools developed by um, bioinformaticians are, have been funded by uh, government agencies, not by private agencies. Um, Karen actually had a really nice little presentation she gave a few days ago about the, the evolution of how cheminformatics has uh, sort of blended or become part of bioinformatics and the challenges that many of the private companies have put up to prevent uh, chemical data from becoming public. Uh, so it's still a challenge um, and um, PubChem has had to fight many battles. Um, uh, other data providers have had to fight battles. We've even had to deal with um, Bayer complaining that we use the word aspirin in our database. Um, so I, I think most are starting to realize the benefits of working and doing public um, open access models, um, but it, it's, it's still one reason why cheminformatics and even metabolomics is lagging behind. We use databases for lots of different things. Many of us create our own sort of little databases um, to help consolidate data. Uh, we use that to help retrieve information. Um, many databases are intended, especially in the world of clinical work, uh, to have reference values or reference data, uh, reference sequences in the world of GenBank, reference images uh, for analysis of um, um, medical or histological conditions. Um, a lot of databases are used in machine learning to help with training and um, testing. Um, likewise, similarity searching. We do this all the time when we're looking on Google. Uh, many of you will notice that Google has automatic spell checks and it'll ask, did you mean this? Or you can do image searches and it'll get things that are close and exact to the image you wanted. Uh, so we can search by image, spectra, structure, sequence. There's also a lot of 
utility in databases for prediction. Um, and, and a lot of what we do in bioinformatics is about prediction. We like to be able to take some of the information we've learned, some of the trends we've seen, and then we say, well, next time I'm going to see this, this is what I predict will happen. Um, of course, prediction has been part of bioinformatics for many years, structure prediction, function prediction, property prediction, phylogenetic prediction, activity prediction. It's also been part of cheminformatics and drug discovery and drug design for many years. So databases lie at, a heart, at the heart of many things we do in bioinformatics, heart, many things we do in, in the omics sciences and the biological sciences. There's a certain progression for databases. Most databases, uh, and I've been involved in building lots of databases, actually started out for me as hobby databases. I was just trying to catalog things to help me teach um, classes. Sometimes for me just to remember things. Um, I think that's the way a lot of other databases actually started, um, including some of the first sequence databases. Uh, over time, the database might grow to be more than just a hobby. It starts to become curated. Uh, it becomes, if you have enough know-how, you can make it into a relational database. Um, you try and make it relatively unique and non-redundant. You go from what was once limited depth and limited coverage to something that's greater depth and greater coverage. The final evolution of many databases is that you go from that hobby to database to a fully archived open deposition often redundant database. This is what GenBank is. This is what the Protein Data Bank is. Uh, this is what Metabolites, L-I-G-H-T-S, uh, is. These are um, uh, relatively large databases measured in gigabytes now. Um, users deposit their data. It's not so much archival or curator driven where curators enter the data by hand. Um, some cases people realize that archiving is too difficult and they go back to originally curated databases. Um, and this is not only it's difficult, it's also very costly. So only very large publicly funded centers can generally maintain archived um, databases. And most laboratory developed databases end up being more curated databases. So examples of those curated databases we've talked about are things like the Human Metabolome Database. It is not an archival database. It's not maintained by a large public body. It's maintained by people in my lab um, who work very hard at it. Um, as you move towards these simple hobby databases to these larger scale archival or even the curated databases, there's more need for data standardization, there's more need for um, automation uh, to make uh, updates consistent and extend those across all of them. And then you also have to have much greater querying capabilities because typically the user database or user size increases and queries become more exotic each time. Um, so I'll talk about databases that are probably cover all three uh, over the next little while. I'll go back to the reason for databases because of this problem that I'd identified uh, early in the morning, which was, you know, genomics and proteomics had already moved well past metabolomics because in part they not only had searching tools like BLAST and MASCOT, they had databases like GenBank and um, Uniprot and Swissprot, which allowed people um, to query um, with their data and to get answers. So for a long time, metabolomics didn't have either the query tool, the analysis tool, or the databases to do that. And that's where uh, ourselves and, and Jeff and, and a number of others have been involved. The initial problem was, 15 years ago, was that most of the data in metabolomics uh, was in textbooks and in journals, in, in paper. It still is, and there's a lot of it because people have been doing pure metabolite analysis and pure biochemistry longer than they've been doing gene sequencing or protein sequencing. So there's a lot of material in there, a lot of structures. Uh, but because so much of that's in paper as opposed to electronic resources, it's meant that metabolomics is generally lagged behind genomics and proteomics. The other thing is that 
metabolomics, as you guys have learned just from talking about your specialties, uh, maybe talking amongst yourself, is that people are in every area. We've got people doing plant and microbiome work, and clinical work, drug work. We've got people doing NMR, others doing MS, others doing GCMS. We've got some people that are more bioinformaticians, so others are more pragmatic chemists. We've got clinicians. And this just it represents the, the, the typical collection you'll see for people doing metabolomics. If we were doing genomics, the audience would be somewhat more uniform. So I'm going to talk about some of the databases, uh, I guess in three or four different categories, spectral databases, NMR and MS ones. Um, many of these databases are for small molecules, not specifically metabolites. And there's just basically chemical property databases or compound databases. Those are things like compound names and physical properties. Probably the most important database we'll talk about are pathway databases. And uh, I guess I'll emphasize this point at least one or two more times. But uh, metabolomics um, still stumbles, still fails as a science, at least to my mind, because we're unable to do the proper interpretation of the data. I think, you know, we've given you some examples of almost or near automated uh, spectral conversion. You know, upload an NMR and a few minutes later you've got everything read up. Upload a GCMS spectral a few minutes later. If you go, go to these kit-based MS systems, upload your sample and an hour or two later you've got your results really fast, really automated, high throughput. But when we come up with our lists, we do an abysmal job at in interpreting our data. We don't match or meet the standards that many uh, proteomics and transcriptomics and genomics people routinely achieve. And that's because in metabolomics we're obsessed with catabolism and anabolism, the assembly and breakdown of compounds. And that's because most of the pathway databases we use, i.e. KEG, just cover catabolism and anabolism. And we're missing, uh, I'd say, you know, 80% of the letters in the alphabet, if that's what we're looking at. So if you could only see 10 or 8 letters of the alphabet, and if that was only the only thing you could write with and the only thing you could read, um, you'd be missing most of the literature. And that's basically what we're doing with our very limited pathway databases. And that's in part because we don't include the signaling element that molecules, especially small molecules, have. We don't include the disease component that small molecules participate in. Those are not depicted in any of the databases uh, that we typically use. Um, the other database of import is the comprehensive metabolomic database. Many of these are organism specific and they're particularly useful in, in metabolomics data analysis. So I'll talk about each of these databases in more detail. So the NMR databases, uh, there are a number of them. These are examples of them. Um, some screenshots. Most of them are ones you've never heard of, uh, even if you are in NMR. Um, so there's the Spectral Database Standards in Japan, maintained by the AIST, as opposed to the NIST database. Um, it's actually been around for a very, very long time, for more than 40 years. Um, it has now more than 25,000 spectra um, for mass spec, uh, tens of thousands of, of proton and carbon NMR spectra, FTIR spectra as well. Um, the numbers are probably a little different than what you have in your books or references, but these are the latest numbers. It has lots of search tools. Although most of the compounds are not metabolites, they are generally useful. On the other hand, uh, there's a resource called the Biomag ResBank. This one is specifically about um, biomolecules uh, and molecules that are metabolites. Uh, the Biomag ResBank is better known in the world of structural biology because it maintains reference data for protein uh, NMR, thousands of protein NMR assignments. But when they started offering um, this data for metabolomics, uh, it only took about a year or two for the metabolomics downloads to exceed all of their protein downloads. 
Um, so it's very popular and it's actually quite well done. Um, they've been dialing back on some of the spectra that, and metabolites that they have. So there's 387, I think your notes might say 680, but they've removed a lot recently. But they have a lot of spectra for these samples, both in proton, 1D, and 2D, carbon, proton. You can do a fair bit of standard searching. The focus of the compounds that they chose were primarily plant metabolites. But plants do share some elements of similarity with humans and other mammals. And so uh, probably about half of them would be considered uh, mammalian metabolites. They've done a really nice job of assigning all of the spectra, um, so that makes it quite useful. There's another open source database um, called NMR ShiftDB. Um, there's about 50,000 spectra for about 40 some thousand compounds. It's maintained in Germany and Chris Steinbeck was the one who originally developed it. Chris recently left um, EBI and is now back in Germany focusing more on, on chem informatics. Um, it is like the SBDBS is not restricted to um, metabolites. It includes many chemical compounds. It has some nice tools for chemical shift prediction, uh, which are similar to mass spectral prediction. And uh, you can search through a variety of mechanisms and, and names. So it's, it is a, an impressive site, um, but it doesn't cover a lot of metabolites. So those are the NMR databases. Um, of course, if you guys used Basil today or if you've used Kenomics, those also have their own spectral databases. Likewise, HMDB has actually a much larger NMR spectral database uh, than most of the others. Uh, but it is more strictly a comprehensive metabolomic database, so I won't talk about it until later. Now, there are mass spectral databases. We've mentioned a few of these already. We've talked about the NIST database. We've talked about Metlin. Uh, I've mentioned GOLM and, and MassBank briefly. Go into a little more detail. The GOLM database is one of the oldest publicly accessible databases for metabolomics. It's been around since the late 1990s. Um, and was written about, I think, in 2003 or 2004. Um, so it's a GCMS database. Uh, it has more than 2,000 compounds that are in its archives and about 11,000 spectra that are linked to those compounds. Uh, it's compatible with NIST and AMDIS. Uh, again, um, just like the Biomeg ResBank, there is a focus on plant metabolites, but they're continuing to expand it. Uh, you can both uh, analyze and submit data to it. So this is the GOLM database website. How many people have ever heard of it? One, two, <laughs> okay. It's better than most years. Um, but it is, a, um, it is a pretty impressive database. It's maintained by, I think, the Max Planck Institute um, and is um, continuously updated. So. I've been following it for many years and always impressed by the fact that they're always adding to it. You can search through it. Um, it's not the most user-friendly resource, but it, it is uh, very searchable. Uh, you can look through different spectra and, and compare them. Um, it has a lot of retention time data. Um, and uh, if you're looking for a free resource on GCMS, this is a good one. I've talked uh, about some of the other ones, uh, Metlin, NIST, uh, MassBank. There's a number of commercial providers. GNPS uh, actually has grown quite a bit more than what I have here. It's hard to track right now. Um, there's MassBank of North America, Mona. Has anyone heard of Mona? One, two, three. Okay. So this one has a very large resource. It's open. Uh, Metlin, again, I think, how many people have heard of Metlin? Everyone should have heard of Metlin by now. Um, and then NIST. Um, so uh, in terms of spectral size, uh, Mona has um, some of the largest, uh, you know, more than 230,000. It also has a lot of compounds, but a lot of the compounds are... Um, theoretical compounds with theoretical spectra. So the true number is actually about 12,000 compounds with authentic spectra. 
Metlin's around 13,000. NIST around 9,000 unique spectra or unique compounds. Mass Bank around 11 or 12,000 compounds. Wiley produces its own respect, GNPS. What, when you look at what's available in terms of MS spectra, at least tandem MS spectra, there's only about 20,000 compounds that actually have their spectra available. So it's a tiny number relative to the number of compounds that have GCMS spectra. And it's not much more than the number of compounds for which NMR spectra are available. Um, Metlin, uh, I guess it's, yeah, it's 240,000, 68,000 high resolution, 13,000 compounds with MSMS -MS spectra. More than two-thirds of those are actually peptides, dipeptides and tripeptides. Um, and most metabolites aren't tripeptides. It was just an easy thing to collect, and so they did it. Um, Metlin's search, um, it's you can search by mass, you can search by um, various adducts, um, you can get hits and results from that as you would with other types of, of searches um, with other databases. Um, the structures are provided, uh, links to the spectra are also provided. It's not downloadable, uh, it's quite protected because in fact it's used commercially by a number of um, companies now. Um, so it's become ever harder uh, to actually access the Metlin database. Um, but uh, it is a fairly rich resource. In contrast to Metlin, there's MassBank, which is totally open. Uh, it was originally developed in Japan, and now there are uh, branches not only in uh, Japan, but also in Europe and in North America. So this is Mass Bank of North America. Uh, it has lots of different types of spectra uh, from different instruments. It covers about 15,000 compounds. Not all of them are unique. Uh, some of them are you know, overlapped. So uh, there might be a, a slight exaggeration. The Japanese uh, site has been defunded. Um, and it's only just maintained. And recently the website went down. <laughs> and hasn't come up. Um, so if you want to be able to access uh, MassBank as, as it was in Japan, uh, you have to go to the MassBank Europe website. Um, but it has uh, a capacity for people to do peptide and peak searches, uh, rather just straight peak searches, uh, for MS and MM, MS, MS data. Um, and it's actually quite nicely designed. Now, the Mass Bank of North America is an extension of Mass Bank of Japan, and it has many, many more predicted spectra and, in essence, predicted compounds. Uh, so it's having a different philosophy than the others. Um, the Mass Bank Europe also has a lot of uh, data from contaminants, uh, water contaminants, and um, um, that's sort of the exposome and a kind of a new direction for metabolomics. So in addition to these spectral databases, which cover NMR, GCMS, LCMS, MSMS, um, there are also compound databases. So some of the better known ones are things like PubChem, which all of you should know about. Uh, ChemSpider. How many people have heard of ChemSpider? Okay, good chunk. How many people have heard of Kebby? Not so many. Uh, how many have ever heard of Ligand Expo? One. Okay, so Ligand Expo is a collection of compounds, crystal structures, from the protein data bank. Um, so these include drugs as well as metabolites and cofactors. So it's, it's an interesting resource. So Kebi um, has got about 55,000 compounds right now. It was originally developed primarily as an ontology database, just to give definitions. Uh, a lot of the compounds are sort of borrowed from uh, KEG, drug bank, lipid maps. Um, you can get synonyms. They do a lot of good work on synonym uh, or proper naming. Uh, there's also information about the structure, and it's quite searchable. The most popular chemical database is PubChem. 
It's now 94 million compounds in PubChem, about 230 million substances. Um, basically, to qualify, it has to be a compound with fewer than 1,000 atoms. So that can include some pretty large, almost, proteins. Uh, it has lots of contributors. Um, and it has various ways of classifying the different compounds. There's quite a bit of information visible now in PubChem. It's growing all the time. There's actually huge amounts of information that are hidden in PubChem. And so if you know people in PubChem, they can sometimes release that information to you. Um, it's exceptionally well linked. And the information that they're collecting is, is um, getting better all the time. However, PubChem, as I said, um, less than probably 0.1% of the compounds in PubChem uh, are related to biological entities. So 99, 99.9% .9 of the compounds in PubChem have nothing to do with biology, have never left the lab, and will never ever be found in any organism. So if you use PubChem to identify compounds uh, in a metabolomics experiment, you have a 99.9% .9 chance of being wrong. ChemSpider is a similar model. It's maintained in uh, Royal Society of Chemistry. It has a slightly different model. Uh, not quite as many compounds as PubChem, but more data sources. Um, it has some interesting links and also has some interesting connections to various spectra. Um, it um, kind of ebbs and flows depending on who's in charge of it uh, in terms of how public it is, how useful it is. Uh, but again, just like PubChem, 99.8% of the compounds um, are not biological. They are not found in any living organism. Most of the compounds, in fact, in both PubChem and ChemSpider probably were not synthesized. Um, a lot of them are in sort of virtual screening libraries where people think they made them, but they, they're not sure. And so they've just uploaded what they think the structures are. And this is how you can get millions and millions of structures. Um, so it, it is really not a reliable indicator of the true chemical uh, space that is, is out there. The best estimates we have of the number of chemicals that are actually produced, manufactured, or available at more than picogram levels, it's about 200,000. That's the total chemical inventory globally. And of those, only a small number, probably less than a few percent, are actually biologically relevant. The others are things like dyes and food additives and things like that. Ligand Expo, this is one that no one's heard of. This is uh, the protein data bank extraction of the small molecules uh, in proteins, protein binding sites. Um, unlike other databases, which just give you sort of two-dimensional representations, these are the actual 3D structures of the molecules. Um, and they are available in a variety of formats. There are other kinds of compound databases that are lesser, not as well known. Um, 3D Met, probably no one's heard of. Knapsack, has anyone heard of Knapsack? Okay, only Karen. Um, lipid Maps, how many people have heard of Lipid Maps? A few of you? Uh, probably no one's heard of My Compound ID. Um, so 3D Met is a 3D structure database. Uh, so it's a little bit like Ligand Expo, and these are either crystal structures or modeled structure of natural compounds. Mostly are plant. Knapsack is a really nice one because it links metabolites, plant metabolites, to species data. Um, so if you know what plant you're analyzing, go to Knapsack because it'll probably give you a list of those compounds found in that plant. My compound ID is something I'll talk about a little bit more, but this is something that was developed in collaboration with um, ourselves in a, a lab at the University of Alberta, headed up by Liang Li. Lipid Maps um, has about 30,000 lipids, and it's been maintained in UCSD for a number of years. It established the nomenclature, sort of the official nomenclature for lipids. But most of the lipid map data is actually derived from another database in Japan, which had lipids. So it's, it's I think it's really just primarily a, a nomenclature database. 
So my compound ID was developed as a resource to address the dark matter of the metabolome, those 90-some percent of the peaks that you can't identify. And the assumption here is that the 90 percent of the compounds that we can't identify are metabolized metabolites. So you eat something, it goes through your gut, and the microbiome, and it's transformed into something exotic. And so what they've done in my compound ID is, is codified about 75 metabolic transformations, phase one, phase two, as well as some of the um, fragmentation events that can happen with uh, metabolites just sort of through decomposition or even mass analysis. So it took, at the time, about 8,000 human metabolites from HMDB and then did a, essentially formula generation. It didn't do structure generation. It did formula generation to calculate molecular weights uh, from that. So roughly um, a 40-fold, almost 50-fold um, increase for the number of starting metabolites to the number of first bass metabolites. And then from those 370,000, another 30-fold increase to get what are called second-pass metabolites. So there's 11 million metabolites, of which 99% are theoretical. Structures are not there, but masses are. And so this is a website that's available through my compound ID. And so people can search masses with this to see if they can get potential hits. Um, and um, in that regard, it doesn't give you a structure, but it gives you a potential match and says this, this could be a metabolite that's related to the starting compound, which has gone through some of these transformations. Um, so if you upload data to my compound ID, you can perform searches and it can produce potential structures if the structures exist or have been generated. Uh, as I say, most of the theoretical ones are actually just masses. So I'm going to get into the, the part that I think is the most relevant, not only for today, but also for tomorrow. And these are the pathway databases. So this is what connects metabolomics to proteomics to genomics to biology. This is how ultimately how you interpret things. Um, so there are a number of databases that are out there that are pathway specific. Uh, KEG, how many people have heard of KEG? Who has not heard of KEG? Okay. How many people have heard of Reactome? A few. How many have heard of a BioPsych? A couple. And then the Small Molecule Pathway Database. A few. Okay. So again, I think everyone's familiar with KEG. Um, these are important resources. Um, they do provide that linkage. This gives actually people doing metabolomics a, a slight leg up on the other people doing exclusively genomics or exclusively proteomics. Um, many of the pathway databases will cover multiple species. Uh, many of them allow to have or provide visualization tools to do some kind of mapping, uh, and which also assists with interpretation. So KEG is the best known pathway database. It's the oldest one, arguably, um, and uh, maintained in Japan and has been around there for getting on, I think, 20 years. Um, the pathway wiring diagrams are very compact and, and quite informative. Um, they use essentially the same structure of all pathways and then map those pathways to all the thousands of organisms that have been either characterized or sequenced. KEG also contains compound data. Uh, it also contains drug data. Uh, but it's a little surprising. So, well, many of the compound data databases like Knapsack or HMDB have 50 to 100,000, KEBI more than 50,000. KEG only has 18,000 metabolites. It has a lot of drugs. Many of these drugs um, are not really drugs. Um, there's only about 2,500 known drugs. Um, so the other 9,000 are sort of exotic um, herbal medicine phytochemicals that no one really calls drugs. Um, and then they have a, a big focus on, on glycans, which used to be of interest to the people in KEG, but has the number steadily shrinking. 
The total number of pathways in KEG is just a little over 500. Um, and it's trying to cover all the pathways corresponding to all phyla kingdoms of life. So plants, insects, animals, mammals, microbes. And there's some pretty exotic pathways. Um, bottom line for the number of pathways in mammals is about 100. So if you're a human, you're a mammal. So there's only 100 pathways in KEG covering your biology. And of those pathways, all of them are about catabolism and anabolism. So none of the KEG pathways have anything to do with signaling. None of the KEG pathways have anything to do with um, disease um, or pathological conditions. And so if you limit your interpretation to KEG pathways by metabolism, you get almost nothing, nothing useful. Now, the other thing that's been problematic with the KEG pathways and which led to things like reactome appearing and, and others is that there's very little biological context. If you are a naive user of the KEG pathways, you'll click on a generic pathway um, and you might think you're thinking that this is a human pathway, uh, but it may not be labeled as such. And so you'll see this description of photosynthesis. And I've had students come to me saying, I didn't know humans would photosynthesize. Um, most people who have worked in KEG are not aware that the TCA cycle or citric acid cycle happens in the mitochondria because in KEG none of that information is shown. TCA does not happen outside of the mitochondria. Um, so there's no organelle context. Um, there's no information about the different metabolic, catabolic, anabolic pathways that are followed by the heart or the lung or the liver, which are all very different. So without the biological context, without the organelle context, um, a lot of people are, are misinterpreting or misunderstanding the biology and biochemistry. So that was one reason why we started working on the small molecule pathway database, as a way to capture more of the biological context, um, but also to extend it from just simply anabolism or catabolism to things like signaling and disease. So the small molecule pathway database um, has a lot of pathways. I don't know, Karen would have a, no, a better idea of exactly how many, but the stats doesn't work on this one anymore. Um, so about 400 drug pathways, 200 disease pathways, uh, 220 catabolism and anabolism pathways, and then 40 other pathways that we can't really identify for sure or classify easily. Um, what's done with the small molecule pathway database is to draw metabolic pathways, but to show the, their context, to describe where they are. Are these pathways that happen in the mitochondria? Are they pathways that happen in the cytoplasm? Are they pathways that connect different tissues to different cells to different organs? We also wanted to be able to depict the molecules because right now with KEG it's simply a dot and the proteins which is simply a square. Um, so we wanted to be able to show that information. Uh, we wanted to be able to show the, the membrane structure, the nucleus. We also wanted to try with SMITDB to map gene chip, protein expression and metabolomic data onto the same thing. Um, and it has tools that allow you to take lists of chemicals proteins, metabolites, and genes to, to identify pathways and to, in some cases, perform disease diagnoses. So this is what a SMPDB pathway looks like. Uh, you can see the pink and red thing, that's a mitochondria. You can see uh, other types of organelles um, depicted. You can see the green Circles are the proteins. Uh, the white boxes contain the structures of the metabolites. Um, you can see in some cases the metabolite being produced. I guess this is for PKU. Um, the um, aberrant molecule that's produced and the effects that it has on the brain um, and on other tissues. Uh, you can also see some of the cofactors where they appear. All of the pathways in SMPDB have uh, text explanations explaining what the pathway is. 
all the compounds are hyperlinked to HMDB, all the proteins are hyperlinked to Uniprot. So again, this is trying to give you both a biological context and a chemical context um, and a pathway context through, through a text explanation. You can type in lists of metabolites and the metabolites will then be highlighted on the pathways uh, and you can play around with checking things on or off uh, and to see how many are visible. It has sort of the Google Maps viewing tool so you can zoom in and zoom out and scroll left and right. Uh, you can also enter data related to concentrations and the concentration data is also mapped to uh, the colors on the metabolites. Um, again, you can see organs and tissues depicted within the pathways. There are different views. Yes? Quick question here because I have struggled with this window previously. Do you have to have absolute quantification to do this or can you do full changes? You can have relative quantitation for this. Um, so, so you can choose any number. Uh, it'll still give you sort of a color or create a color scheme. You can also change the depiction. Some of the, the views in SMPDB are sometimes quite large and sometimes complicated. So you can switch it from a color view to a black and white view to a keg view. Um, also the pathways are uh, saved in different formats. They can be saved in a biopax format, SBML format, SBGN format. Um, and a pseudo keg, they can also be saved as SVG or PNG images. All the pathways that are in SMPDB are actually generated through a, a web server called Pathways. Um, so Pathways for Pathways. Um, it allows you to basically have uh, a, a vehicle accessible anywhere to produce machine readable pathways. Uh, we've had a few people contribute to Pathways. It's actually an open access system, so if people wanted to draw Pathways, they can be added in. Uh, they have to be pretty good in order to meet the, the requirements. Um, but as a tool, it allows you to generate machine-readable, Biopax, SBML, SBGN models, and to generate different pictures, full color to black and white to keg-like to uh, SNPDB type. And then it also supports viewing. Karen is the local expert uh, in Pathways and also in SMPDB uh, and has been working on these Pathways for more than a year now, year and a half, most of her life. Um, and these are some of the examples of the tools, the pull-down menus uh, that can be used to, to try and generate or edit reactions, enzymes. Um, you don't have to draw an enzyme, you don't have to draw a structure. Uh, many of these things are available through links to HMDB uh, or through Uniprot. You just have to be able to click and drag. And so again, this is an online web-based tool for drawing. Uh, and you can pull down these different modules and images. Um, you do have to spend a little bit of time, you know, sketching out what your pathway should look like. Because if you don't, it'll start looking pretty um, ugly. Um, but it, again, just like with any drawing tool, allows you to uh, expand, shift, and rotate things to fit your screen. There's a whole collection of icons um, for livers and um, endoplasmic reticulum and uh, transporters. And so pathways with cofactors, transport pathways, uh, disease pathways, signaling pathways, protein and metabolite pathways can all be depicted. You can also have zoom boxes that are associated with activities in particular regions of a cell uh, with the ribosome or rather the mitochondria or endoplasmic reticulum. So what the intent of SMPDB and someday I hope uh, SMPDB will inco be incorporated into Metaboanalyst is to try and capture those things in metabolism that are much more relevant to uh, biology. As I said, you know, 80% of what's really relevant in metabolomics is not captured by KEG. That 80% re relates to 
disease pathways, pathological pathways, and signaling pathways, most metabolites play some kind of signaling role. And you know, the classic example is the, the Warburg effect, which is fundamental to all of cancer, that there is no Warburg pathway in KEG. And the immune response generated by the Warburg pathway is well known, but it's not depicted, again, all directed by small molecules. So these are things that we miss over and over and over again when we try and interpret our metabolomic data using just catabolic or anabolic pathways. The last set of databases I'll talk about are the comprehensive metabolite or metabolomic databases. Uh, so I'll include KEG in that because it links um, chemicals with pathways. There's EcoPsych, HumanPsych, sort of the psych databases. There's also metabolites. Um, to pass muster, they have to have at least a thousand compounds. Many of them are organism specific. They have to be updated continuously. And they have to contain more than either just chemical data or more than just pathway data or more than just spectral data or more than just um, uh, biological data. So they need to combine two or more um, elements together. So metabolites, um, which has been running for a few years, is uh, technically the gen bank for metabolomics. This is an archival database. How many people have deposited data in gen bank, or rather in uh, metabolites? Okay, one. How many people have deposited data in gen bank? <laughs> None. Um, anyways, this is a problem uh, in the sense that ideally when you prepare data, um, in metabolomics, you should be sending it to some archival resource. Uh, a fair bit of money has gone into establishing metabolites. It's maintained by the European Bioinformatics Institute in Cambridge. Um, and you can upload your chemical data, you can upload your experimental data, method, process, your compound data, your lists of data. Uh, it takes just about everything. Uh, it takes and combines that data um, allows you to do querying, is linked to KEBI. Uh, it complies with the Metabolomics Standards Initiative. And so I certainly encourage people who are collecting metabolomic data to try depositing it to metabolites. Uh, as most of you know, we've also been involved in maintaining metabolomics data and databases. Um, I guess technically we don't the first comprehensive ones uh, the Human Metabolome Database, which appeared in 2006. Uh, Drug Bank is another database, uh, actually many times more popular than the Human Metabolome Database. So that links drugs to drug targets. And so that's used by many pharmaceutical research companies. There's a yeast metabolome database. There's a phenol, uh, polyphenolic database for foods. E. coli metabolome database, a food metabolome database. Uh, contaminant DB, SMIP DB, um, toxic metabolome or toxic exposure database. There's also now, more recently, a, a new fecal metabolome database. So those of you working on microbial studies, that just came out a few weeks ago. So these are all maintained uh, by people like Karen uh, and like Manoj and Mark, who contributed to that work. Uh, I mean, human metabolome database was actually um, started in about uh, 2005. It was funded originally by Genome Canada as a project, uh, the Human Metabolome Project. And we were mandated to identify, quantify all the metabolites we could in common biofluids like blood and urine and cerebral spinal fluid, and to make that data freely available. Um, that expanded from just human endogenous metabolites to drugs and foods and toxic exposome data. And it included the experimental work that we've done in our lab, as well as data that's in the literature and has been compiled by other people. When we first started looking at this, um, when we looked at the, the databases that were online, human psych and keg, total number of compounds that they listed was 690. 
So that was the entire extent of the human metabolome. Uh, the first release of the human metabolome database was in 2006, and we tripled it in size. And it was big news because people didn't think the human metabolome was going to be that large. Um, then a couple years later, it expanded to 6,400. A few years after that, it was 37,000. Uh, in 2017, it was 42,000. And then as of 2018, it's 114,000 compounds. And as I said, it looks like it'll be well over 200 or 300,000 compounds. So it's grown quickly, both as our knowledge has grown, but also as our understanding of what is in the body and what constitutes the metabolome. Um, this is a little dated, and I probably should have updated it, but these are some numbers that I showed earlier about the size. The total number of, of endogenous metabolites now in the human metabolome database is around 65 to 70,000 and the exogenous metabolites about 30 to 40,000. So these resources are maintained in a bunch of different websites, um, and their URLs are given here. Uh, with the Human Metabolome Database, as I said, it's now up to 114,000 compounds. About uh, 200 microbial metabolites are, that are unique, about 1,100 they're associated with the gut metabolome, which includes both endogenous metabolites as well as microbial metabolites. There's lots of information on diseases, lots of spectra. More recently, we've generated a lot of CFMID spectra. So there's a couple hundred thousand spectra, MS and GCMS. With HMDB, you can do searches against sequence, uh, protein sequence, um, gene sequence. You can do spectral searches. Uh, you can browse. You can search by pathways and disease, biofluid, concentrations, and so on. Um, most, I think, people have probably seen some part of the HMDB. Uh, it links to the small molecule pathway database. It has um, links to the various spectra that have been either collected in the lab or uh, predicted elsewhere. Right now, there are a little over 100 data fields in any given metabolite entry. And the spectra can be searched through standard search tools. There's been a, a very recent upgrade to the spectral searching, a number of improvements for it, tandem mass spectra, as well as parent ion searches with various rankings. You can do NMR spectral searches. You can do a variety of structure searches to look for similar or identical structures. You can look through a variety of biofluids and look for different diseases. There's several hundred inborn errors of metabolism that are also tracked. Um, there are at least, uh, I guess, close to two dozen biofluids or excreta uh, that are measured. Lots of stuff specifically for clinicians and physicians and clinical chemists. Drug Bank, as I mentioned before, is actually quite a bit more popular than HMDB uh, in part because of its utility in um, repurposing drugs. So lots of drug companies make use of it, and a lot of new drug treatments have been developed through this particular database, just simply finding what was largely already in the literature, but being able to explore it in more detail. Uh, has lots of information about drug, drug interactions, drug food interactions, drug transporters, drug metabolism, um, mechanism of action, pharmacological, pharmacokinetic, pharmacogenomic data, uh, absorption, distribution, metabolism as well. Um, a lot of focus, there are protein drugs, so it also has information on their structures as well as the small molecule drugs. Many of the same tools in HMDB are also available through Drug Bank, including chemical queries, uh, category browsing. Both HMDB and Drug Bank now have a more formal ontology that allows you to look for things based on uh, function, uh, biological role, industrial role, um, health effects, um, and other related properties. Um, lots of information on gene and protein sequences and lots of ways to extract data in a more detailed way. 
a toxic exposome database. Um, this is about the toxic compounds that are found everywhere. Uh, covers things like pesticides and herbicides and endocrine disruptors, solvents, um, PCBs, furans, carcinogens. Um, and it's very much like a drug database, but the compounds aren't drugs, or most of them aren't. Um, it has lots of information on uh, chemical genomic data. Food database is about the compounds that are in our food. Uh, about uh, 700 foods are covered in there, but also information about the flavor and aroma and color that some of these uh, food derivatives are associated with and their effects on human health. Um, so it's a little more complicated than what you'll find on your cereal box. Yeast metabolome. Uh, yeast is used to make bread. It's also used to make wine and beer and many other things. Uh, so there's more than 2,000 metabolites in the yeast metabolome database. Uh, lots of detailed information about proteins, enzymes, but also about the products that are produced through fermentation, which are kind of unique to yeast. Uh, structured very similar to uh, the human metabolome database. Same thing is with the E. coli metabolome database. This is a bacterial one. Um, and again, the number of metabolites um, that are there. Um, lots of reactions, pathways, um, information on transport and processes. Lots of spectral data for the compounds. So what I'm trying to highlight is that there are databases for specific needs. And if you're trying to simply turn only to PubChem, you miss the point. Um, if you know something about your system, and most of us do, uh, there's no reason why you should be looking at just generic chemical databases. You should be trying to turn to either organism-specific, environment-specific, um, purpose-specific databases, because these will have the information that allow you to interpret the results you get, but also limit the results that you are attempting to see or, or, or find. As I said, 99.9% .9 of the hits you'll get with a PubChem search will be wrong. Versus if you're searching through an organism-specific database, at least it tells you if it's there uh, or if it's been uh, found in that particular organism. So this just is a sort of a comparison between different databases, the types of things that you'll tend to look for, whether it's information on nomenclature, References or links, the types of spectra, links to pathways, structures, descriptions, definitions, chemical properties, and physical properties. Those are what you typically need in a comprehensive database to be able to interpret things. So I guess it's time to wrap up because it is now exactly 4.59. Um, so you can continue uh, if you'd like. Uh, you can come back to the lab um, to play around with some of the interpretation or uh, data analysis or um, spectra to list studies you did. Or alternately, if you're tired and want to enjoy the nice day outside, um, you're done.